afternoon, everybody. Welcome on this beautiful snowy day. Who would think we'd have snow when it's time for spring? Um, but it is beautiful, and I hope you didn't have too much hassle getting here. Um, I'm Gretchen Spritzer, and I'm the faculty director of the Center for Positive Organizations. And um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce you to what we think is going to be a really special kind of event. This is the first time we've done a book event like this, and we have an amazing double header lined up. So we're really excited about it. Uh, the way the program's going to work is that we're going to have two uh, TED-like talks um, with some chance between each talk for you to generate some questions at your table that you'd like to ask the speaker. Um, and then after each speaker has gone, we're going to have a facilitated discussion um, by Rick Haller. Rick, who is right here, is one of our executives in residence of the Center for Positive Organizations. Rick is the uh, recently retired CEO and, uh, or president and COO of Wallbridge. And they're, <laughs> and they're the company who have created these beautiful buildings uh, for us. So we're really glad to have him here with us today to help facilitate that discussion. So I am very excited about this double header. As you know, we've got two amazing books Awakening Compassion at Work by Monica Warline and Jane Dutton. Monica's going to um, be the first to go in just a moment. And then Stretch by Scott Sunshine. Scott is one of our own, um, and it's great to have him back as part of his book tour um, to be with us. So let me ask, how many of you have never been to a Center for Positive Organizational, Center for Positive Organizations event? All right, well, you're in for a treat right now because as those of you who have been to an event before, the first thing that we're gonna ask you to do is stand up and make a high quality connection with somebody you don't know. This is a way to build some energy in the room as we get started. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is stand up right now, look for somebody that you have not met before and introduce yourself and make a high quality connection. All right, thank you. I can really feel the energy in the room. So at this point, I would now like to turn the program over to Jane Dutton, one of the co-authors of uh, 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 Awakening Compassion at Work. And many of you know Jane. She's one of those people that really needs no introduction. But in case you don't, let me just tell you a couple quick things about Jane. She's the Robert L. Kahn Distinguished University Professor of Business Administration and Psychology. Uh, she's one of the founders of the Center for Positive Organizations and is the author of more than a hundred books or uh, articles and book chapters. <laughs> <laughs> you had a promotion too, Jane, and 13 books. Um, pretty amazing. Uh, but what I think is most impressive about Jane is that she practices what she researches. So it's not just a theoretical exercise, it's something that she actively integrates into her life. And as a result, I mean, she's a wonderful mentor uh, and a wonderful colleague. So with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Jane, who's going to help us with some uh, introductions. Okay, thank you, Gretchen. Actually, they've told me to speak into this, so I'm going to oh, try speaking yeah, into this. Okay, um, well, happy snowy afternoon. Um, it is my honor to introduce two of the most extraordinary organizational scholars I've ever met in my 40 years as an academic, and that's the truth. I had the pleasure of working with both of them when they were grad students at Michigan. Monica was granted her PhD in organizational psychology, and Scott was granted his PhD from the management and organizations group here at Ross. Monica is currently the CEO of her second startup called Enliven Work that teaches, teaches businesses how to tap into courageous thinking, uh, compassionate leadership, and curiosity to bring their best self to work. She's a research scientist at Stanford University's Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education and is a faculty affiliate of our Center for Positive Organizations. Scott is a Henry Gardner Simo Simons, Professor of Management, I should have asked you, Scott, how to pronounce it, at the Jones Graduate School of Business at Rice University. He's an award-winning researcher, important editor, and part of our research advisory board at the Center for Positive Organizations. I would like to share with you some of the qualities that these two amazing scholars have in common. 
First, they share the fact that they went to great undergrad programs, Stanford for Monica and University of Virginia for Scott. They have other qualities in common, too. Both are highly creative, both in the topics they study and how they study them. They have a nose for what is interesting research topics. They make the ordinary seem extraordinary. Both are beautiful writers. People I know in the field speak to me often about this dimension of their work. Both are courageous scholars. What they study and how they study it takes bravery. Their topics are often off the beaten path. It often takes them into uncharted territory, yet they are both fearless in tackling complex issues with the tools of ethnography, interviews, and humble inquiry in ways that allow them to reveal significant insights. They are also have both done um, enough research on very important topics. For Monica, it is research on compassion and work organization, and Scott with his research on human resourcefulness, that they both decided it was time to write a book. And voila! The two books were published just weeks apart, and both of the books are soaring. We are very fortunate to have two of them share their wisdom in brief book talks as part of, their, as part of this first ever Thought Leadership Showcase. So we're going to start off with Monica, and so I'm going to ask her to come to the stage. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Chris, for the invitation. Thank you, Rick, for um, hosting our discussion today. And Scott, thank you for sharing the stage together and sharing your book launch month with uh, Jane and I. It's been actually really fun to um, be in that space together. So today, I'm going to share with you two questions that I hope you will take away and ponder because they're vital questions for the age that we live in and they're very much at the heart of why we wrote the book Awakening Compassion at Work and I will give you just a taste of the answer that Jane and I offer or the answer we begin to offer in this book. So many of you have probably heard the statistic that you will spend at least 100,000 hours of your life working. Um, for a lot of people in this room, you'll actually spend a lot more than that. So um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, think of 100,000 hours of your life and how you would like to spend it. Think of 100,000 hours of your life and over the course of that 100,000 hours, you will do something that you're very proud of. You will, I know. Uh, you'll do something that um, gives you joy. Right? You will do something that welcomes your colleagues into your life in a fantastic way. Um, maybe it'll be the birth of a new baby, or maybe a grandchild, um, or a niece or a nephew. Maybe it'll just be the introduction of a puppy. Um, this is my dog, Amaya. She was the apple of my eye. And uh, this is just a few days before she died last year. And so she's here with me today to remind me that over the course of 100,000 hours of working, you'll lose loved ones. Your community will suffer some kind of a disaster, a fire, maybe a flood, something that washes people's lives away and demands recovery. Over the course of 100,000 hours, we will all do something that we're not that proud of, or we will make a mistake that causes us regret. And so if you think of that 100,000 hours and just glance the surface of it in the way that we did, it asks this question. Right. Why do we insist on this myth of inhuman business when so obviously the work is suffused with the joy and the suffering of all of life's experience? Okay, that's question number one. Now, it is a pretty extraordinary time to be alive. We're getting close to the middle of the 21st century 
And it used to be pretty unthinkable that people could fly, but now we fly around just to give book talks. Uh, and in fact, SpaceX is ready to take tourists to the moon. It's a pretty extraordinary time to be alive because it used to be unthinkable that we could talk to somebody unless they were right there by our side. And now, of course, technology has shattered that barrier for a long time, but now we could actually broadcast to billions of people all around the world right from that iPhone right there on Facebook Live. Wow, right? It's a pretty extraordinary time to be alive. The wonders of this technology, the wealth and the abundance of human experience that we are creating is so unfathomable. And yet, 50% of people in the United States, when asked by a survey researcher, will say they have no one in their life they could talk to if they had a significant trouble. Suicide is growing in every single age demographic in the United States. And far more than 20 million of our fellow citizens are going to be touched by addiction every single day this year. So we live in this incredible wonder of technology and abundance and wealth, and yet we aren't asking deeply enough, what is the role of the world of work in alleviating this epidemic of human suffering that we are surrounded by? So that's the second question. And those two questions are really the heart of Awakening Compassion at Work. Now, I want to tell you a story. And it's actually a really mundane story. Um, and it's not in the book. Because it's just unfolding over the, the last few weeks. Um, I have a friend whose name is Ling. And she's a product manager in a global technology firm. Her firm has been going through a merger. And the senior management team has been really careful to try to preserve as many positions as they could during this merger. But some people had to be let go. So Ling and other product managers at her level were deployed across the organization in lots of geographic spaces to go meet with their new teams because people had been reorganized, teams had been reconfigured, whole divisions had been tossed up in the air and put back together. And it was time to get the engine firing and get the product um, development rolling again. And so my friend Ling called me the day after she came back from her visit to her new team in Romania. She'd been sitting in Romania with a group of male Central European engineers. And she says to me, Monica, not to be stereotypical, but I call these guys the big men of the organization because they're usually really stalwart. They're really focused. They don't usually like to talk about fuzzy stuff. They're engineers. They want to get to work. We were sitting there having lunch. I asked how they were coping with all the changes, thinking that there'd be a little bit of grumbling. And there was utter silence around the table. But they were visually, visibly agitated. And I asked again, what's going on, guys? And one of them said, on behalf of the rest of them, we're going through a work divorce. And she was taken aback by that phrase. But she asked them to explain. And they started to tell stories about how the colleagues that had been transferred rapidly to places all around the globe had actually grown up together in the company. They spent almost all of their coffee breaks together. If you think of a lot of that 100,000 hours of work time, they'd spent almost all of it together, some of them. 
And they got to know each other so well that they very often visited each other's families' homes. Some of them even took vacations together. So these engineers sitting around the table in Romania were feeling this deep grief and loss and isolation and loneliness because many of those colleagues that they cherished, who they cherished so much, had just disappeared overnight, sometimes without even a chance to say goodbye. Now, that's actually a pretty mundane story of change in organizations. It wouldn't be remarkable to hear that story unless you were listening to it through the lens of those questions. Because if the role of work organizations is not to perpetuate suffering and grief and isolation, but instead, in fact, to be a part of healing that epidemic of human suffering, then that kind of change management is no longer acceptable. It is not necessary for change management to leave a trail of suffering in its wake that is unattended to. Right? And in fact, the case that we make in Awakening Compassion at Work is that not only is it unnecessary for organizational changes and other organizational processes to create human suffering that's not attended to, it's management malpractice to do that because you are eroding the human capability of the organization when you're not tending to suffering and grief and pain and allowing compassion to be a healing force. So if, like my friend Ling, your organization is trying to compete by developing new ideas and bringing them to the market of innovation better than your competitors do, what the evidence shows us is that you're leaving competency on the table if you're not managing with compassion. You cannot be as innovative as you can possibly be if you're not tending to the human pain in your organization. And we summarize evidence from a lot of researchers in this room and other researchers in our field to show how this is true for several human-based capabilities in organizations. So, it's too costly to ignore human pain and human suffering in our organizations, but what is Ling supposed to do? Well, that's the other taste that I want to give you of awakening compassion at work. Um, we think of people like Ling as what we call compassion architects. Um, and that's because we know that they use their discretionary effort and their wisdom and their interpersonal skills to draw out the pain and suffering that's around them and to help tend to it and heal it. And we want those compassion architects to have more skills and more capacity to spread that compassion across their entire organizational systems. So we offer people like Ling a bit of an equation. And it's a four times four equals compassion competence equation. The first four in the equation is compassion as a four part human experience. So first, if you want to be compassionate, you have to notice that suffering is there, right? Like laying around the table, you have to be willing to let that conversation about the work divorce unfold. And then second, you have to be willing to interpret that that suffering that's present in the organization is worth your time and your energy to attend to, and that it's relevant to your work to do so. The third part of compassion as a human experience is that interpreting that suffering as worthy of your time and attention moves you to feel concern for other people's well-being. And once we feel concern for other people's well-being, what the psychology shows us is that we're instantaneously motivated to act on their behalf. So the fourth part of the human experience of compassion is to take action to alleviate suffering. What's the second four in my four times four equation? The second four 
is four essential aspects of an organization that people like Ling can work with in order to make compassion more repeated, more widespread, and more competent across their system. So you can work with the culture and values of your organization like Ling did with hers to make her case to her senior management that something needed to be done to address this situation. Um, what are the fundamental beliefs and values that we're making about human nature? And are we believing and valuing that humans are worthy of compassion in the workplace? The second part of the social architecture that compassion architects design and draw on is the networks of the organization. This is how people are structurally connected together. Who talks to who? Who asks for advice? Who shares information? And this is how people in organizations are seen, how they come to know each other, how they come to feel recognized. This is what combats loneliness and isolation. In Ling's case, these networks have been really wiped out. And there's a lot of work for compassion architects to do to try to create some healing around how people are connected together in the organization. The third part of architecting compassion across your system is to work with the roles in that system, how responsibilities are defined. Um, Ling is redefining what it means to be a product manager by saying, as part of product management, I should be taking care of the people who design the products with me. Right? It is fundamentally a part of my role to attend to the fact that there is suffering here and to figure out ways that we can contribute to alleviating it. That's a part of managing the product. And almost every role that you can imagine can be reimagined with more care and more compassion. Finally, compassion architects work a lot with the routines in an organization, the routines for how everyday things get done. And you can reimagine how to do those routines with more compassion as you do the work. Are you hiring for empathy and compassion? Are you training people with an eye toward connecting them together? Are you rewarding people and giving feedback in a way that's sensitive to um, the pain and suffering in the organization? Any kind of routine can be reimagined to create more compassion and more competence across the system. So that's your compassion equation. You're now certified to go out there, try it out, uh, become compassion architects for yourselves. Jane and I are counting on you. Uh, and we are inventing all kinds of new ways to tell stories about how compassion architects work, what they do, and the kind of skill sets that they need to develop. So you can join us at awakeningcompassion.work.com, where we're doing right now 100 days of awakening compassion. Thank you.